So um, thank you, first of all, to uh, the Summer Fellows and to my colleagues and especially to our guests for being here with me today. Um, as uh, Natalia said, um, I'm going to be talking today about small businesses and particularly ways that they can successfully compete with larger businesses. Um, we had a talk yesterday, actually, in our other speaker series that was uh, titled Surviving Extinction. And when I heard that, I kind of thought, oh, no, there's no way I can compete with that title in terms of, uh, in terms of importance. But you know, this afternoon, that word extinction was kind of in my head. And I was kind of thinking about it in terms of um, you know, one of the ideas that people kick around when they talk about small business, which are, are small businesses a dying breed? And... The answer I'm gonna give you today based on the research I've done is an unequivocal no. Um, that in most industries, there are absolutely room for small businesses to exist and prosper alongside larger businesses. That doesn't mean all small businesses will prosper, but that does mean that there is space. And we're gonna talk about that space that larger businesses leave open today. Um, so back to that idea of extinction for a second. I'm going to talk about a couple of the sort of common narratives you hear out there about small businesses. Um, and the first one is exactly that, that doom and gloom sort of idea that um, small businesses just don't stand a chance. Um, you know, this uh, op-ed from the New York Daily News said, instead of growing Chicago's retail economy, Walmart simply overtook it, absorbing sales from other city stores and shuttering dozens of them in the process. So this is kind of like the Godzilla theory of small businesses, right? That that these giant businesses are kind of unleashed on a town. Yes? Was that Walmart in the city or on the city? Yes, Walmart actually entered the west side of Chicago. Most of the cities haven't let them in. No, no. This was um, an instance when they did. Uh, and actually, that reminds me, thank you uh, for raising your hand, because I did want to say... Um, Absolutely, um, put your hand up at any time. I'm happy to take questions while we do this. Um, if I think they warrant a longer discussion, I may hold you till the end when we'll have you know some more time, kind of formally for a Q and A. But um, like my colleague Patrick said last week, economists are used to uh, kind of a give and take when we when we present. So, you know this this under attack idea. Um, Obviously, you know, there is some truth to the idea that there are challenges that small businesses face when competing against larger rivals. And a lot of that stems from what we call in economics economies of scale. And just really quickly, what that means is a large business has lower average costs, can do things more efficiently, therefore they can charge lower prices often. Um, they could potentially charge a price that a small business couldn't profitably charge. So that's a lot of the thinking behind this sort of large businesses being inflicted upon your town um, kind of idea. But there's another narrative, too, which is sort of small businesses as a cause, right? That this is something that deserves our support. Um, I love this first sentence. Um, well, so, so American Express, you know, ironically, this Titanic company, American Express, sponsors something called Small Business Saturday, where they tell you to go out and support your community and shop for small uh, shop at small businesses. And they say, as a consumer, you're a key part in helping small businesses thrive. Well, yes, pretty much any size of business needs consumers to thrive. Um, so. They've got me there. They say, by shopping or dining at small businesses throughout the year, you're showing your support for small businesses in your neighborhood and in the community you call home. Now, we also really might believe that small businesses are good for communities, that they foster a sense of community, that they provide unique products or services. But again, this idea of supporting small businesses isn't really a long-term way for small businesses to prosper. Um, this hipster selling goat meat, for instance, needs people to actually want to buy goat meat, right? And, and more generally than that, right, this, this blurb right here sort of takes actual commerce and consumer choice out of the equation, right? It, it doesn't, you're supporting something rather than you want the product or service that somebody is selling. Um, so 
the work today that I'm going to talk about hopefully uh, moves away from a couple from these ideas a little bit. And again, I want to say there's probably truth to both of them, but we don't want to get stuck in them, primarily because neither of them really leaves room for small businesses themselves as actors in our economy. It treats them as sort of these passive entities that are swept up in kind of greater winds in our economy or our society or something like that. Um, the research that I did, my goal is to think about helping small businesses think of what they can do to compete against larger businesses, what they can offer the market that maybe larger businesses can't. And what I did to gather the, the qualitative data that I did is I did something fairly radical for an economist. I went out and I talked to a bunch of business owners. And, um, you know, I had pretty free-ranging discussions with them, but um, the key and what I'm really going to focus on today is their answers to the question, what are, the, what are your advantages of being small? Okay, what can you do better than a larger rival because you're small in size? Um, and so we're going to spend most of our time kind of directly talking about what um, the businesses themselves told me. Uh, but we're going to spend a little bit of time first on kind of some of the theory behind why some of these things that small businesses are better at doing, why they're better at doing them. Um, and, you know, we're going to see, we're going to think about the idea that kind of economies of scale are not just a consequence of growing large in size, they're a trade-off. And you trade off other things as you gain economies of scale. Um, and this leaves open certain competitive advantages that small businesses can have. Um, I'll tell you a little bit after that about um, the methodology, about these conversations, these interviews that I did with business owners. Um, and then we're going to spend a while looking at um, specifically the advantages that these guys cite. And I'm going to argue that those advantages fit our th uh, theoretical framework very well. Any questions kind of first before I go on? Great. OK. so. Really early on in this project, um, I thought of an analogy to a pretty famous 60-plus-year-old paper by Friedrich Hayek. Um, and, you know, this paper was written at a time when there was really still a very lively debate about whether free market economies or centrally planned economies were better. Um, and that's what this paper is about. Like I said, this is sort of an analogy to what we're working on, but I'll, I'll circle back to that. Um, but Hayek's argument is really cool. He basically says, any economy, you've got people on the ground, consumers, firms, et cetera, that are gathering information, right? A shopkeeper very intimately knows what his or her customers want, right? Because he or she interacts with those customers. OK, now, if you have a centrally planned economy, what happens is you need to somehow communicate all of that information to a central planner, or a central planner needs to somehow internalize all of that information and then make decisions about the economy. But in terms of doing that, in terms of passing all that information to some kind of centralized decision maker, a lot of detail is going to get lost. So what market economies do to solve that problem is they place decision power in the hands of consumers and businesses who are on the ground, right? the people who are actually gathering the information. And then he goes on to discuss how prices are sort of a way to communicate information um, between these different groups in the economy. And I love this paper because here you have one of the most famous advocates of free market economies ever. And he's making this argument not from the perspective that you know, the market economy is this beautiful, perfect thing in equilibrium and everything is being allocated exactly right. He's coming from the angle that the economy is a messy thing, where information has to be communicated and can get lost in between people. Um, it's more of a network kind of approach. And in that case, sense, it's really ahead of its time. But I think that when we think about advantages that small businesses might have, this is precisely the way to think about the economy in this kind of messier kind of network type of way. And I'm just going to read the second quote here. It follows from this that central planning based on statistical information by its nature cannot take direct account of these circumstances of time and place, and that the central planner will have to find some way or other in which the decisions depending on them can be left to the man on the spot. 
So small businesses, as we kind of go on and think about this, are kind of our man or woman on the spot. So, right, how do we kind of operationalize this idea in terms of thinking about businesses? So I want to basically, in a really general way, think about firms as entities, as organizations that are taking in information, making decisions based on that information, and implementing those decisions, right? And, you know, first we're going to think about sort of a large business, and, and these three kind of nodes, these circles at the end are meant to represent, you know, locations of a chain store or offices in a big company, that type of thing. So those individual locations are on the ground and they're taking in information and they're each taking in different information. Okay, but decision making in some ways has to be centralized. And I would argue in order to achieve economies of scale, you have to centralize decision making to some degree. You know, if Walmart gave each and every one of its store managers full control over what products to stock, it would lose a lot of the bulk discounts and the efficiency that it gets from saying, here are your products, go. Now, it might give them a little bit of autonomy, kind of on the margins, but the point is that to reap these cost benefits, decision making is being centralized in some way. Okay. And so then that the decisions are involving combining all of that information, right? And so in a, in a stylized way, each of our locations then, which are implementing a decision, are implementing something that's based on all of this aggregated information. Okay, now if we look at these locations instead as individual small businesses, my, my little color coding of blue, green, and red is sort of meant to symbolize that what I say in the middle, that small businesses can understand and tailor their decisions more directly to local markets, customers, and operations, okay? Each of them on the ground is able to take in the information and make more specific decisions based on that information. Again, that doesn't mean small businesses are better than large businesses. Large businesses have this huge advantage of economies of scale. It just means that there are trade-offs involved and businesses growing big leave room for small businesses then to thrive. Another way to think about all of this real quickly is in terms of division of labor. So as a company grows, division of labor usually is gonna get more kind of cordoned off, right? There's gonna be marketing people and buyers and you know people setting strategy, and then there's gonna be people working at the stores, interacting with customers, right? And we think of that as adding efficiency, just like, just as we've been talking about, and it does add efficiency. But it does make this sort of information that we've been talking about, this information transition, transmission, excuse me, a little bit more complicated. And you can again think of things getting lost. And, and we'll see some examples of that as we go on. So um, before I move to kind of these interviews, any questions? Okay. Yes, sir. Doesn't this change somewhat with the introduction of big data? Because Amazon, I'm assuming, doesn't have a centralized planning office. They just have algorithms that tell them what people are purchasing all around the country at any one time, all around the world at any one time, and their supply chains just react automatically. I see a computer retailer in Pittsfield um, which I would have, I, there only were two, so I suspect that it was, it's more really a, a computer yeah. um, repair shop. Right, right? yeah, it's um, not. Yeah. So, uh, and let me give you an example. Dell, you phone up Dell, or you go online to Dell, and you actually order your individual computer, and it ships <coughs> you three or four days later. Uh, they don't repair. Don't they? So, you, what I'm saying is big data really is changing all of this uh, some of the competitive situation. Yeah, I, I think that's a great. Um, I think that's a great question and a great observation. And certainly, information technology in general is going to make you know within a larger business maybe information being passed around more efficiently. It's going to make them able to reach consumers more directly. Um, but let's compare like a small town bookstore to Amazon for a second, 
right? Now, not everybody's going to want to go to the small town bookstore and shop. In fact, most people are probably going to want to go to Amazon. But there's a loyal customer base, and this bookstore can tailor its space, its recommendations, its relationships with customers directly to these people. And there are going to be some group of people who want that direct attention, that direct interaction, that experience. So I, I absolutely agree it would change. I don't think it would sort of fully change these ideas. Um, good, <laughs> excellent. So I spoke to 14 um, business owners in depth. I spoke to um, some more briefly um, about, like I said, several questions, but really focusing on what do you do better because you're small. Um, and some of these guys, we can't mention their names, but a lot of them we can. And just a few examples we have. Um, Car Hardware, which folks in the Berkshires usually know, has about six locations around here. Um, Whole Life is really neat. It's a um, pet product uh, manufacturer. It essentially manufactures organic pet food and pet treats. Uh, it's based in Pittsfield. Um, this photo is of Little's Pharmacy in North Adams, Mass., which is the um, last remaining independent pharmacy in that market. Um, and then Jackson & Connor is this uh, men's clothing boutique in Northampton. So just a few examples. Now, those are all, well, we have one manufacturer and three retailers there. I also talked to several financial managers, consultants, more kind of professional service um, type of operations. Um, so... What was interesting about this and what really, I think, kind of helped this process is hearing the same things from different people in different industries, um, hearing how the same ideas kind of translated to very different industries. Um, and so hopefully some of that will come through. Um, so here's what they told me in like really bird's eye view level. Um, these are the top six advantages that they reported um, of being small in size. And again, this is not scientific. This is just based on the conversations I had. Um, but all 14 told me something about product quality, product selection, the ability to focus on some kind of market niche. Um, almost all of them, 12, told me about um, customer service and really how small businesses are organizationally more equipped to form real lasting relationships sometimes with customers. Um, another very common one was kind of nimbleness in a way, um, flexibility, quick response time to different events. Um, understanding of local or niche markets is not at all surprising. Um, and these last two, uh, I know they look less important on this graph, but again, these are the top six uh, responses. Um, Relationships with employees and the performance of employees, um, feeling that they're more bought into a family type organization. Uh, and then the ability to sort of innovate um, and the kind of flexibility and space um, to do that were also cited. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about the first four, though. So just, just really quickly on product offerings, this is you know, important as the sort of unanimous thing that people put out there. Um, as we talked about, economies of scale are going to require some uniformity in product offerings across locations if you're thinking about a retailer or the type of service provided if you're talking about something in a professional services type industry. Um, now, small businesses may be able to offer more specialized product or services, and there's kind of two ways that people told me this happens. Okay, one is kind of directly tailoring product offerings to your local market or your local customer base, and the other is kind of finding and focusing on a market niche. And so a few examples of that. Um, so Jackson & Connor is this menswear boutique in Northampton, Massachusetts, and it's got an owner and one employee, and that's it, and it's this beautiful little store, and you go in and, and there's the owner in this really crisp suit and then with like a beard down to here and then his one employee has a beard down to here too. And um, there, and basically this place thrives on the fact that the owner personally selects most of the products. He works with designers who will only work with small retailers or online. Um, 
And here's this idea that there's less division of labor than in large chains, right? The guy picking the products is the same guy interacting with the customers. Um, now, in a larger firm, the guy interacting with the customers can talk to the guy picking the products. But again, some of that detail, some of that color might be lost. Um, but again, this is not to say this is the only way, right way of doing it. This simply may not fit the business model of larger chains who are looking to achieve higher cost efficiency. Again, you know, a Brooks Brothers or a men's warehouse is going to want, um, is going to need some kind of central decision making in terms of products being offered. Its business model is going to be to be able to sell at more of a discount than a place like Jackson and Connor. Um, Another one of these retailers, and this is the Pittsfield computer retailer, um, that um, is kind of basing its product offerings directly on needs and feedback of their customers. So Mad Max, which is a cute name, it's a computer retailer in Pittsfield. Um, and they can heighten their focus on product quality in some ways because of their small size and their ability to directly respond to customer feedback. Um, the owner told me they basically, as a rule, they stop carrying a product if it's returned by more than two customers, um, right? And so they're being directly informed by customer feedback um, in terms of their product selection without layers of management, without having to call some central office and say, you know, customers really aren't happy with this. Maybe we should stop carrying it. And then a meeting takes place and those types of things. Um, so this is also a story about flexibility. I think one takeaway from these different kind of ideas of different types of competitive advantages is they're all very interrelated um, and kind of based on the theory, the kind of diagram that, that I already showed you. Um, in terms of market niches, so Whole Life, the pet products um, manufacturer that I already told you about, um, Right. The, the owner said to me that consumers of, you know, very kind of high end organic pet products are a very educated bunch. They really care about the ingredients. And in fact, Whole Life specializes in what they call one ingredient foods. So like here's dog food, ingredients, chicken, done. OK. And a lot of that, a lot of what goes into those products is basically due to manufacturing being close to the person gathering information from the customers. Again, this is all happening, you know, the, the office and the factory are in one place. Um, and so he said that larger manufacturers will offer organic pet food, but they really can't respond to these very specific customer needs um, in the same way that, um, that a smaller business that's really kind of laser focused on this niche can. So customer service, again, is a big deal for small businesses. Many, many businesses told me this is their number one asset. Um, and the theme that I saw is that it's focused on building sort of long-term customer relationships. Um, a great example is this financial advisory firm in Albany um, where the, I think it was like the CEO, is the second in command. He told me that um, in larger firms, executives are gonna rely on sort of these general numbers to track how their investment advisors are doing. Basically, and, and this is a great example of the sort of aggregating information from the Hayek paper that we talked about. So this is, right, basically, are you, are you keeping your clients? Are they not leaving? And is your revenue stream being maintained? Now, this requires customer service, but it basically requires customer service at a certain threshold level, right? And so these advisors are not going to be incentivized in a larger organization to build as deep of relationships with clients as perhaps in this smaller organization. So here again, we have less... Um, direct uh, or, or less division of labor and um, fewer people to monitor, which means that the monitoring that can happen can kind of take advantage of all of this color, of all of these qualitative details. Um, and thus, you can put an emphasis on the long term, on customers liking and feeling comfortable with their advisor, that type of thing. Again, a lot of people are going to want the cheaper, maybe easier alternative 
some people are going to go for the relationship. And right, the amount of people going for that relationship may not be enough to sustain a large business's revenue, but it could be more than enough to sustain a few small businesses' revenues. Um, Little's Pharmacy that I mentioned um, sort of has this major part of their market that, uh, that they play to, which are less mobile patients, elderly or very sick patients, because they offer free home delivery of prescriptions. And none of the competitors in the area offer that, which I thought was interesting. Why doesn't CVS just get a van and do that? And you do, um, well, and so the owner said, the owner's idea is basically that doesn't fit their business model. CVS is predicated on getting you in the store to buy candy bars, toiletries, over-the-counter medications, where their profit margin is considerably higher than on the prescriptions. Now, in larger markets, they do um, kind of take a half measure, right, which is offering drive-through pharmacies. But that's probably a matter of competition, right? That's probably a matter of, in larger markets, they need to compete with other large chains. And so, you know, things like drive-through pharmacies happen. Um, not only do um, these relationships kind of build repeat business um, and improve the customer base, but uh, there's learning, as we keep talking about learning, that directly goes on from customers. Uh, I spoke to the former owner of an energy consulting firm uh, that was based in Philadelphia, and he ended up selling. This was a neat little experiment because he ended up selling his company to a much larger firm that did lots of other things in the energy industry, and they thought they would enter this space. Um, and, you know, they saw these sort of golf outings and other client events that this small company was doing as basically a drain on revenue, as something that, you know, inc um, something that increased costs without a tangible benefit that was easy to measure in the way that a centralized decision maker needs to measure things. Um, and they eliminated those events. But this small company felt that that was part of the way they were getting detailed information about their customers and about their customers' needs and wants with a lot of color to it. So the ability to respond quickly and more flexibly to, um, to events or new developments in a market. So one of the things that Bart Razor, who owns Car Hardware, told me was when there's a weather event in Western New England, right, they can very quickly stock um, different goods based on if you're going to get a blizzard or a flood. Now, um, Home Depot can do the same thing, but again, car might be able to do it a lot quicker because Home Depot is going to have to deal with layers of management and decision making. And this kind of leads to a little bit of a positive feedback loop because a place like car, a local place, is going to start gaining a reputation for being the place to go, OK, there's going to be a blizzard. I need salt. You know, I know they're going to have enough for the community. Um, Back to this idea of you know, the, the potential upside of having less division of labor, of having less specialization. Um, there can be faster communication between different parts of the firm. Um, and one example was um, this woodworking company, Benson Woodworking, where they said that um, shipping and building were basically you know, right across the hall from each other, were coming out of the same location. Right Now, sometimes there would be an item that would turn out to be too big um, to be shipped in one piece. And the shipper could immediately say to the builder, hey, cut this in half. It can be reassembled on the other side, right? And let's get it to the customer. Whereas in a larger organization where, you know, that piece was brought to some kind of hub to ship, et cetera, et cetera, that might have resulted in a lot more of a delay. Um, also, um, another idea is that I said operations um, in the beginning, tailoring to a firm's operations. A smaller firm is going to have the flexibility to find the inputs, the computers in this case, that, um, that they need. Again, this is the energy consulting firm that was bought by a larger company. They had a computing system they were very happy with. The 
parent company said, no, we have an exclusive contract with another computer maker, which gets us these sweet prices, you have to switch to these or it would violate our exclusivity deal. And you know, lo and behold, it was a worse match. So just a couple more of these um, in the area of understanding local markets. So this is a great example of um, the idea of, you know, of, of the customer, of the person responding to customers and the person listening to customers being in the same place or being the same person. So the owner of Littles has his office right behind the pharmacy counter. And he told me he started hearing nurses um, complaining that elderly patients were having trouble managing their meds, when to take them, how much to take if they had already taken them. And so they were very quickly able to respond to that kind of local market intelligence. Remember, this is also a place that's serving a niche of people with home delivery. Um, and so they were able to switch to these blister packs with the dates on it so you can keep um, track sort of much better. So again, a quick bit of market intelligence, a quick decision, and you're more directly serving your kind of niche of customers. Um, and Jackson and Connor, we've essentially already covered this, but um, they, oh, no, actually, we haven't covered this. Um, another source of their business is being very involved in the community, right? And so um, he told me a story about an opportunity that just very quickly arose because there was a magazine that was doing a photo shoot for the mayor of Holyoke. Could they provide the clothing and the styling for the mayor of Holyoke? Um, and these are things that sort of being a local business and plugged into the community um, can offer. Um, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about challenges of small size, but does anybody have any questions based on some of these examples? All right, I'll move on then. So I just wanted to quickly touch on something that um, you can um, actually, if you provide your email from uh, a link on the brief online, you can download a little extra piece that's about this. But I wanted to talk about some of the challenges of small size that um, these guys told me about and how they address them. Um, so larger competitors, so first of all, we've, we've hammered home the idea of price competition that larger competitors can drive down prices. Um, one way that small businesses mitigate this is by um, joining buying cooperatives. So Ace Hardware and True Value um, are a great example of this, are not big chain stores like Home Depot is. They're actually a network of small, privately owned hardware stores that form, a, that form buying cooperatives. And they're also sort of given a little bit of branding um, on the side from this. And the owner of Car Hardware is part of True Value. And he said, he talked about the flexibility of it, that basically he was able to buy about half of his goods through that cooperative, presumably at lower prices than he would be on his own. And then for other things where he was less happy with their choices, he was able to buy them you know, himself through other sources. Name recognition and marketing um, can be more difficult for small businesses. Um, there's not a huge budget for advertising. There's not the ability to maintain like a coherent brand opportunity identity as you move from place to place to place. Um, again, local community involvement, networking with other businesses, getting your name out there through word of mouth are, are ways that businesses mitigate that. Um, you know, one so market research is an interesting example of right. We talked about some of the potential advantages of having less division of labor. But one of the disadvantages of being small and having you know, low to no division of labor is you don't have a department that's out there having focus groups, um, analyzing big data, as was brought up, um, those types of things. So you may be really good at getting information about the trees, but you may be missing some of that information about the forest. Um, and trade organizations are a big part um, of, of how small businesses address that. And finally, many of them said they were more susceptible to regulations, taxes and labor laws and environmental regulations than are 
um, bigger businesses who, again, just have the resources to deal with that. Um, trade organizations, again, can be a partial solution to this, advocating for, um, you know, sort of fair regulatory treatment of small businesses. Okay, so we're about done here, other than questions, but um, just again, the main ideas we've been through, scale is a trade-off, right? To achieve economies of scale, larger businesses have to centralize some of their decision-making and separate some of the functions of the business. Um, small businesses then are sort of the man on the spot, as Hayek said, um, and competitive advantages are built on being able to sort of tailor decisions directly to localized information, customers, specific operations of the business. Product offerings, customer service, speed flexibility, familiarity with local markets um, are the most cited advantages. And you know, I think one takeaway from all of this is it seems like the most successful small businesses are not competing with r larger rivals on those larger rivals' terms, right? They're instead, they're focusing on openings that are left by those larger rivals, which are enough for them to sustain and prosper. Um, so this was really interesting work um, and conversations to have. Um, I hope this kind of, you know, lets people flip the narrative on small businesses again and sort of see as kind of actors in the economy what they can do and what they can do better. Um, so I thank you all for listening and let's have some questions. Yes, sir. Great stuff, thank you. Um, did, did the subject of passion come up at all from any of these small business owners? I'm an uh, ethnographic researcher, uh, which is very qualitative, and I study the emotions of consumers. Uh, I have a client with uh, 550 stores that has used big data to a point that they have crippled themselves. Uh, because big data can tell you the what, but can't tell you the why. It, it strips the emotions away and it streamlines. And if used correctly, it can be a wonderful tool, but if not, you go too far in one direction. And this store, uh, its core customer is very passionate about the products. And so are the employees at these stores. But corporate has streamlined the process so much that it has stripped all of the emotion out of the buying process. Mm. And what's happened is some of that core target is now leaving and going to boutiques mm -hmm. uh, because they're going to be met with an employee and an owner who is as passionate about the product or service as they are. So I'm just wondering, for many of these small businesses, did, did passion and emotion, their love for what they do and their love for what they sell? Yeah, it, it, it did in several ways, and uh, so. There's actually, there's an interesting paper that's out there in one of the journals that covers small business um, that was sort of a very exhaustive survey of kind of the goals and kind of ideals of small business owners. And, you know, one thing that that kind of, one notion that that, that paper kind of debunked is that most small businesses want to get big in some way. Right, that most people are in it for you know growing into a billion dollar business. It turns out the number one aspiration of most small businesses generally, because I, I don't have the paper in front of me, but it was essentially to make a living being their own boss doing something they loved, pretty much. And so there was that. I think that. Let's see, the, um, the clothing store, Jackson and Connor, I think was all about passion. It was all about the owner and employee's personal interest in this kind of stuff. And then the relationship element of it also, I think really plays into that, both customer relationships and relationships with employees. It was Car Hardware said they have way less turnover than the big guys do. People work for them as a career and they attract people who love what they do, who love peop giving people advice about projects, hardware, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, that's really important in a lot of different areas. Thanks. Sir. Um, oh, we got all the way in the back and then one in front. Do you want to? Yeah. Um, why don't you talk to Guido? 
I, I should have. I didn't have enough time. I, 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 I'm trying to remember if they were on my list or not, um, but, but they would have been a good person to talk to. Absolutely. Um, why didn't I? I don't remember why I didn't. Sorry, I don't have a good answer for your question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You indicated that the small business, the 14 that you met with, all had these sets of skills, which you enumerated, and were able and were successful because of them. Uh, it used to be that a small business, business could just plunk down in a commercial strip, and if the, if the flow of customers was good enough, they could prosper. Now it seems they need these special skills. Where does that leave all the proprietors of the retail stores who don't have those skills? Are they the ones who are going out of business? So I think I, I, I kind of see two answers to that question. Um, one is it's not that it takes unique talent to have these advantages that I talked about. Many of them are inherent in having a well-run, passionate, small business, right? The, the second thing I would say, though, is that to some extent, yes, you're right. Um, there are, um, you know, as, as there's consolidation, as there's more big box stores, as there's the internet, there is a shakeout. And, um, I, I didn't show it here, but I did some more empirical research last year and the number of small businesses, especially in the retail sector is going down. Um, and the revenues, um, are going down as a share of total revenues in their industries. And... Yeah, I, one great example of that actually is in grad school, I did research on travel agents and how brick and mortar travel agents were, what was happening to them is there were all these, you know, Expedia, online travel agents, that type of thing. And um, one of the things that came out of it was from like 97 to 2005 or something, about a third of brick and mortar travel agents exited the market. So this is a major shakeout. A third of them went out of business. Um, but out of curiosity last year, I went back to the census and I looked at the data to see, well, was that the beginning of a huge trend or was that most of it? And it turns out that was most of it. Um, it had sort of gone like this. And the other two thirds seemed to be robust or resilient in some way, probably because they were planning more complex travel directly with customers with whom they had relationships. So all that to say, yes, it is harder for small businesses um, these days. There will be shakeouts. People will go out of business. But um, that doesn't mean, again, that it's a downward slope forever. That might mean that it's a little bit of a downward slope and then it plateaus. It's kind of a general comment. Yeah, my way of thinking as well. I think it's like in terms of a pendulum, you know, when the, with the online revolution, right? Everybody thought that was going to be, you know, everybody was going to do everything on the computer, you know, sit mm -hmm. on your couch and order a suit. Right. So I, you know, for me personally now, I see it swinging the other way with that human contact, like talking about the passionate, the human contact, like that, that small uh, uh, men's store you're talking about there, you know. It's kind of swinging the other way. My, you know, a lot of people they don't want to go online and get mm -hmm. that suit. Whatever they want that human right. contact and that. And so, like you're saying, the, the example of the um, of the uh, one you just mentioned, you know, where they lost a, the travel agencies, they lost a third, mm -hmm. right? But the ones that survive, it's kind of true to that point that right. there is always going to be that personal right. human contact. Mm -hmm. That is never going to be replaced by yeah. by the internet and large yeah. debt. Exactly, and you know you see you know, a couple of things. Again, um, there's always kind of a human tendency to extrapolate trends, to see a trend happening and sort of run it to its logical conclusion and think that's going to happen. Right. And, you know, in sports or stock markets or, you know, you see it all the time. And, and that's kind of a little bit of the pendulum swing you're talking about. But, you know, in, in, in this case, I think an example of that pendulum swinging backwards is this kind of local business movement. Um, 
which I talked about a little bit at the beginning. Now, I didn't, um, I was sort of in a tongue-in-cheek way, you know, talking about small businesses as sort of a charity case. But this local movement is something that's identifying better things about small businesses, more direct interaction, more um, of all of that. And so I think that does represent kind of the pendulum swinging the other way. Sir? Um, could you comment on what kind of impact uh, government requirements have on a small business versus larger business?